Okay, so we're going to talk now about pharyngitis. Um, pharyngitis is basically a sore throat. Now, pharyngitis can be viral, but it may be bacterial. So this is one, this is one time we need to really assess and antibiotics might be needed. Strep A is the most common bacterial cause of pharyngitis. It's an inflammation of the pharynx that causes swelling, pain, and exudate. Adjacent tissues like the tonsils can be infected. Here are some things that indicate it's more likely to be bacterial. So the pain may be mild to severe, but if it's more severe, it may, it, it may be um, bacterial. Sudden onset, instead of I've kind of been getting a sore throat, it's like I woke up and my throat felt like it was on fire. Headaches, fever, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, redness, exudate with visible pustules, um, swollen, lymph nodes, um, strawberry, there's something with strep that can happen at times called scarlet fever, and it's still the same strep infection, but it can also cause strawberry tongue where the tongue is edematous and looks like it has, straw, has uh, pits in it like a strawberry, and or a sandpaper-like rash over um, large parts of the body. Um, so those happen with uh, scarlet fever, which can happen along with a strep infection. So if this is a strep infection and it's not adequately treated, there are two different series potential complications. Rheumatic fever, which we talked about already in the cardio cardiac uh, lecture, and acute glomerulonephritis, which will be covered in the GU lecture. Okay. Uh, medical management for pharyngitis. A uh, diagnosis is important. They need to evaluate if it's strep. There are rapid strep screens. Um, they are more likely to be false negative, not likely to be false positive. So if it's positive, they can begin treatment. If that rapid screen is negative, they usually should go on and do a culture because sometimes that will show up an infection that didn't test positive on the screen. Um, antibiotics are... Um, in, antibiotics are important. Penicillin is preferred. If they're allergic to penicillin, then they would use an alternative antibiotic, but penicillin is, penicillins are preferred. And it's important that parents understand they need to make sure the child takes the full course of antibiotics. Even when they start feeling better, they've got to finish those antibiotics. And then um, antipyretics are usually prescribed. For nursing, we want um, to focus on prevention, hand washing, avoiding exposure to the saliva of others. Someone with strep is on droplet precautions. We need to teach them, complete their antibiotics, don't, don't share or save antibiotics. They should be out of school until they've been on antibiotics for 24 hours and they're feeling well enough. So um, we can't go get the prescription and then send the kid right back to school. They need 24 hours on antibiotics not to be contagious. Um, and it's most, it's gonna be passed by droplets, but kids drink after each other. They put their mouths on the water fountain. Um, they decide to share a bite of their lunch. And so keep them home from school until they've been on antibiotics 24 hours and they're feeling well enough to go to school. Um, toothbrushes should be replaced and any dental appliances should be cleaned really thoroughly to avoid reinfection. We also want to teach them to contact the provider for unrelieved fever, extreme pain, refusing liquids. They uh, just look really, really sick or they're not getting better after 24 to 20 to 48 hours of antibiotics. Also humidifying hydrate. Um, and lots of comfort measures. Uh, one of the things that happens with strep throat is they are hurting, their, their throat hurts too badly to drink. And so it can be hard to get enough fluids in those kids. Popsicles can help with the pain and can also get some fluids in. So that's one option, but also helping parents figure out appropriate dosing for over-the-counter pain meds to, can help their kids eat. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about with the throat is tonsillitis. A tonsillitis can be bacterial or viral. A lot of times it's associated with pharyngitis because they're right there next uh, to each other. And it's inflammation of the tonsillar tissue. Usually this spreads from the pharyngeal tissue. 
Um, what does it look like? Swelling may actually obstruct the airflow. If you look in their mouth, you can see their um, tonsils sometimes. Um, the palatine tonsils, the ones visible, may actually meet. That's called kissing tonsils. And those kids who have kissing tonsils will a lot of times hold their heads in an odd position unconsciously because that maintains their airway open more. Enlarged adenoids can lead to mouth breathing and obstructive sleep apnea. Medical management, if this is viral, it's self-limited. So we ju they just manage the symptoms. Bacterial infections require antibiotics. Now, if a kid is having recurrent tonsillitis, then a tonsillectomy might be indicated. Another reason that um, they might that might indicate a tonsillectomy would be um, sleep disordered breathing. Adenoidectomy uh, would be indicated by a recurrent purulent rhinorrhea, so they have a runny nose with a lot of pus, persistent adenoiditis, sleep disturbances, recurrent or persistent um, ear infections, especially with the, the chronic infection with effusion, which we'll talk about in a little bit, hyponasal speech. Um, sometimes it makes their speech sound very nasal. And if they're affecting growth of the teeth or the uh, orofacial structure. Surgery can combine removal of the tonsils, removal of the adenoids, and if they have chronic ear infections, placement of tympanostomy tubes. Who should not get tonsil surgery? Cleft palate, if they have an acute infection at the time of surgery, that's a big risk for sepsis. Um, if they have any uncontrolled systemic disease or bleeding or um, bleeding disorders, uh, because the tonsils are very vascular and bleeding is a risk. And if they're a poor anesthetic risk. Nursing care for tonsillitis is comfort care, symptom management, which we've talked about. Uh, teach about antibiotics if they have them. Now, if they're having a tonsillectomy, um, what do we do in that perioperative um, phase? Preoperatively, this may be done as an outpatient procedure, so we want to uh, make sure that they're getting age-appropriate teaching. Ideally, they get that teaching like a day or so before the procedure, so it's less scary for them. And then we would be administering any pre-medication as ordered by anesthesia. Post-op, the biggest risk for tonsillectomy is airway obstruction and hemorrhage. Um, so they are recovered in a prone position until they're awake. We uh, don't suction unless it is absolutely necessary and then very, very cautiously. Uh, we want to prevent vomiting and minimize crying because that puts stre um, stress on those sutures and can cause bleeding. Pain management is important um, both for comfort and also because we don't want them crying for a long time. Uh, when they wake up, um, then they, we start with clear liquids and progress to soft foods for a few days. Uh, we want to avoid citrus, dairy, and red or brown foods because if they're throwing up, we want to know um, whether or not there's blood in it. And if they've had red or brown foods, you can't always tell by looking. So what would it look like if this child is hemorrhaging from their recent tonsillectomy? Well, if we see blood coming out, clearly, but they're more likely to swallow it. So if we see them swallowing frequently or clearing their throat frequently, they may have a trickle of blood. Um, if they're vomiting and there's bright red blood, we would be concerned. Some old brown blood is within normal limits. We don't want large amounts. Um, and then what else does it look like when someone's lost a lot of blood? They get tachycardic, they get pale. Eventually, if they lose enough, their blood pressure drops, right? So we're observing for that. We want to catch that early. Some signs of airway obstruction. Well, we've talked quite a lot about what respiratory distress looks like in kids this, this semester already. Um, but think about um, grunting, flaring, a uh, tripod, their chin is jutting out, trying to maintain their airway, drooling, not wanting to swallow because if they swallow that saliva, it closes their airway temporarily. Um, so look at those things. If you hear strider, that's an airway issue or, or that needs to be addressed immediately. But also 
increased respiratory rate. This is why you never, ever, 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 ever fake your respiratory rate. It is kind of an ongoing joke in healthcare that, oh, well, everybody's respiratory rate is 18 or whatever. No, do not ever make that up. Count their respirations because increasing respirations can be an early sign of increasing respiratory distress that we will miss if we're not actually counting them. Documenting a respiratory rate that, um, that we made up is falsifying documentation. Okay, not okay, please don't ever do it. Another thing we might see with airway obstruction um, and um, increased respiratory difficulty of breathing is restlessness or agitation. Discharge teaching, and again, these are usually going home the same day. We want them to avoid irritating or spicy foods. We want them to avoid gargling or being too rough with the toothbrush. Be careful about sticking the toothbrush too far back there. We want them to avoid coughing, clearing their throat, and putting things in their mouths. Um, usually over-the-counter analgesics are enough for the pain. They can also do an ice collar that really helps with the pain. We want them to limit their activity until they're recovered. Let parents know that having some ear pain, a low-grade temp, and some mouth odor is normal or is common in recovery, um, that they should contact the provider if they have a persistent earache, fever, or cough, and that they, they can return to normal activities in two to three weeks. Now, tonsillectomy tends to be a lot harder on adults, um, and I'm not sure of all the reasons why, but adults often have a much more difficult recovery from this. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about with throat and tonsils is peritonsillar abscess. This is a complication of tonsillitis. Um, it's when there's a collection of pus, pus behind the tonsil that pushes the tonsil outward and causes airway obstruction. That obstruction can be partial and it can become complete, so they need to be um, monitored pretty closely. What does this look like? They have severe pain. Their voice may be muffled. They may have fever, difficulty swallowing. When they're chewing, they might have a muscle spasm, okay? And they'll have bad breath and the lymph nodes on the affected side are swollen. Um, medical management, the provider is going to prescribe antibiotics, but if that's it, antibiotics may not be effective if without draining. That abscess may require draining. Um, steroids will be given to reduce the swelling. If their airways endangered, they may, or they're not responding to uh, oral antibiotics, they may be hospitalized. And once they've recovered from the acute infection, a tonsillectomy may be done to prevent that recurrence. Okay, in the next section, we're gonna talk about the flu.